Good afternoon, everybody. Um, bon pomeriggio and welcome to um, this analytical um, webinar on yesterday's EU India summit. Um, yesterday, uh, it was quite a historic occasion because this was just the second summit where all the heads of the EU states, along with the leadership of the European Union, met with uh, the Indian Prime Minister. Um, and today, coincidentally, happens to be Europe Day. So happy Europe Day to everybody as well. In 1950, the first step of what today we call today the European Union was laid on the 9th of May. Uh, one of the reasons why we really wanted to hold this today was, first of all, we wanted to be one of the first to analyze what we had expected to be a very important uh, summit, both for the EU and for India during uh, this really challenging time of COVID-19. Um, also, uh, given it was Europe Day today, it seemed very appropriate that in some small way we honored the establishment of this vast democracy of 27 nations um, by a meeting today. So first of all, thank all our panelists as well as our attendees for uh, making time on a Sunday. Uh, yesterday's EU summit, EU India summit was very interesting because it was in Portugal and Vasco da Gama uh, was a, the por a Portuguese explorer is credited uh, for having found maritime links in between Europe and India in the 14, late 1400s after the fall of Constantinople. So it was um, quite symbolic that uh, Antonio Costa, the Prime Minister of Portugal, himself a son of Goan um, origin, uh, actually was the host of yesterday's EU India summit. And the fact that it was actually held in Lisbon from where Vasco da Gama set out to find his route to India. Um, less on history and uh, more on actuality. It was a wonderful summit. And uh, we've unfortunately not uh, been able to um, get Her Excellency Nina Malhotra live, but she was kind enough to record a message this morning and provide her opening remarks and her input. So I will be playing um, uh, the, the opening remarks of Her Excellency Dr. Nina Malhotra, the ambassador of India to Italy. I'm glad to participate at this important seminar on the European Union and India. I would like to thank local cities and ASCE School of Economic Competition of Venice for organizing this event. It's very timely for the scholars from India and Italy together just a day after the 16th India-EU Virtual Summit. Let me just begin by saying that we attach high priority to our relationship with the EU. The EU is one of our largest trading partners, one of the largest investors in India, and an important source of technology, innovation, and best practices. India and EU are natural partners and share values of democracy, pluralism, inclusiveness, and rules-based multilateralism. There are convergences on a wide range of contemporary global issues and we are witnessing significant momentum in the partnership between India and the EU. Yesterday's India-EU summit was special in the sense that EU plus 27 have met in this format only once before with the US President in March this year. This meeting provided an unprecedented opportunity for discussion with all the leaders of the EU member countries. It was a significant political milestone and reflects the shared ambition of both sides for further strengthening the India-EU strategic partnership. The 16th Leaders' Summit witnessed a number of new initiatives 
which includes a partnership on connectivity, stronger health cooperation in the context of the pandemic, and enhanced cooperation on trade and investment. As the entire world is experiencing prolonged COVID-19 pandemic, health has emerged as an important area for collaboration. As India is battling the second wave of COVID pandemic, so far 15 EU countries have offered health to India. We express our deep gratitude to the European Union. In the context of the pandemic, India and EU both have recognized the value of joint collaborative responses at the global level. We are ready to collaborate with the EU to ensure affordable and equitable access to the COVID vaccine, develop and strengthen global medical supply chains, and a strong multilateral response to ensure access at the global level. While the joint statement issued during the summit sets up an ambitious agenda for collaboration, it's important to prioritize and narrow down areas of collaboration for achieving visible and tangible progress. On the climate change, which is an important area discussed during the summit, there's a conscious vision and commitment of the Government of India, which has placed climate at the center of India's new development efforts. India has made impressive achievements on its Paris climate change commitments, despite our huge developmental challenges and limited availability of energy. We have increased share of renewable energy in our energy mix and are promoting investments in reducing emissions from industries, as well as we are among the few countries where the areas of the forest has increased in the recent years. There are obvious opportunities for the EU to complement India's efforts by providing new climate-friendly technologies and financing green projects in India. We see hydrogen-based technologies and offshore wind as some of the potential areas where EU can contribute to India's efforts to climate change. On connectivity, the EU and India share strong interest and EU is already very active in India in the local connectivity area. India believes that connectivity should be multidimensional and not limited to infrastructure or physical connectivity. It should cover all sectors, including digital connectivity, trade and investment connectivity, people to people connectivity, and security challenges linked to connectivity. The connectivity proposals should be carefully assessed on the basis of international law, norms like sustainable growth and development, and economic efficiency. Like EU, India also believes that multilateralism needs to be reformed. Over the years, we have witnessed undermining of multilateral institutions and the COVID pandemic has further highlighted the shortcomings of the multilateral institutions in the present form. We would like to work closely with the EU on the issue of reformed multilateralism. Italy's role is very cru crucial in enhancing India-EU cooperation and mutual understanding. Italy is a founding and leading member of the EU, member of G7, and numerous international institutions, including the UN, NATO, OECD, OSCE, WTO, Union for the Mediterranean, and Council of Europe, etc. As a leading member of the EU, Italy is among India's preferred partners. Enhancing bilateral relations with Italy will naturally contribute immensely to strengthening our strategic partnership with the entire Union. To conclude, there are a whole host of areas where India and EU can work together. Our partnership has high potential, which is now at a unique threshold to ramp up engagement to promote peace security and prosperity domestically, regionally and globally. I'm sure the deliberations today will be interesting and fruitful and I wish you all the best for your discussions. Thank you. We would 
uh, really thank Dr. Malhotra, Ambassador Dr. Malhotra for her uh, remarks this morning. And uh, that said, connectivity seems to be the name of the new game. Um, I would like to invite uh, legendary Professor Arduino Panicha um, to say a few words about uh, what he reads into yesterday's summit. Professor. Bene, grazie. Eh, ringrazio anche l'ambasciatrice per il sostegno che ha dato al nostro seminario eh, e eh, alle due sigle, la SASCI, l'associazione la, la, presieduta da Vassi e noi, e eh, la scuola di competizione da me presieduta. Eh, perché mh, gli argomenti che affronteremo oggi, riprendendo anche i temi che ha trattato l'ambasciatrice eh, sono sicuramente dei, dei temi eh, di un grande rapporto che eh, negli anni devo dire si era anche un po' interrotto ma che con la conferenza di Porto ha ripreso assolutamente vigore per una serie di motivi che adesso eh, analizzerei molto sinteticamente riprendendo anche alcuni dei temi trattati eh, dall'ambasciatrice. Eh, il problema della tecnologia è un problema molto importante, della cooperazione lo sono, ma ehm, cercherei di ampliare lo sguardo e capire che in questo momento l'Unione Europea, eh, che eh, ha una eh, più lunga tradizione di alleanza con gli Stati Uniti, eh, si è parlato di due grandi democrazie, India e Unione Europea, non metterei da parte la democrazia americana naturalmente, eh, eh, questa grande tradizione di alleanza storica con gli Stati Uniti e una più recente e, diciamo così, meno solida eh, apertura verso la Cina. Ma eh, questa dell'India era cercata come un vero punto, e questo mi sembra uno dei primi paletti strategici che dobbiamo, eh, vado sinteticamente, notare, eh, è un punto di riequilibrio, eh, questo l'India, non solo per l'immissione, la capacità di missione tecnologica di cui l'India è nota, eh, e del quale le nostre imprese hanno assolutamente bisogno le piccole e medie imprese europee non riusciranno a fare nessun vero salto di qualità nel futuro se non attraverso una grandissima dimissione tecnologica e naturalmente questa può provenire in un'alleanza e in una cooperazione con l'India quindi un bilanciamento da un lato dall'altro lato anche finalmente una vera cooperazione sul fronte delle tecnologie ma abbiamo eh, giustamente la Massatrice ha trattato anche il tema uno dei temi che è stato fondamentale, vado rapidamente al secondo punto, quello delle infrastrutture, anche infrastrutture congiunte. Noi non possiamo dimenticare che eh, eh, adesso la via della seta sulla quale abbiamo sentito valanghe di, eh, eh, di dibattiti e di relazioni è in una fase di stallo. Eh, si apre quindi una, una strada importante, interessante a sud che è la parte del, dell'Indo-Mediterraneo, eh, dell che comprende eh, eh, momenti di sicurezza, eh, ma anche delle infrastrutture congiunte che per prime andrebbero verso, per esempio, i paesi africani. Eh, il terzo punto, anch'esso secondo me eh, non da trascurare, è che si era entrati nel, nel free trade, nel, nell'accordo che poi è rimasto sospeso per lungo tempo tra India e Unione Europea, Unione Europea per alcuni motivi. Uh, alcuni motivi sembravano mh, meno importanti, ma credetemi, il fatto di riconoscere le associazioni professionali non è così poco importante. Nel mondo di futuro, segnato dopo la pandemia da una grande disoccupazione e dalla capacità di trovare anche nuovi lavori eh, e nuove vie per, per, per combattere la disoccupazione giovanile, in questa il settore, il segmento dei servizi, il segmento delle nuove professioni sono assolutamente fondamentali. Non possiamo pensare che il trattato, come sempre, parli delle grandi multinazionali, parli dei grandi rapporti tra imprese transnazionali, parli certamente anche del problema che dobbiamo riequilibrare, torniamo all'inizio del rapporto tra Stati Uniti e Unione Europea, nel momento in cui abbiamo parlato dei vaccini. Ebbene, ha fatto Macron a dire che nessuno deve dare lezioni all'India, perché eh, ad un certo momento c'è stata la dei vaccini. L'India ha distribuito, ha fatto la farmacia del mondo fino a quando ha potuto e naturalmente continuerà a farlo appena potrà. Quindi non c'è niente da meravigliarsi, però sui lavori 
che scappano alla nostra attenzione, che non sono i grandi temi, i big pharma, le grandi transnazionali, il digitale, eh, ma che sono assolutamente importanti per dare delle soluzioni anche al lavoro giovanile, dobbiamo entrarci dentro, il trattato bisogna che se ne occupi insieme ad altre cose importanti come quelle eh, degli appalti, anche soggetto di un certo dibattito, poi eh, diciamo andato in una fase di stallo. Eh, altrettanto importanti e chiudo sono le vicende eh, che riguardano eh, eh, l'ambiente anche qui eh, il, la cooperazione può essere grandissima eh, sono state elencate eh, il problema della plastica il problema delle emissioni eh, sono sicuro che eh, cooperando insieme e con un grandissimo sforzo di ricerca e di tecnologia eh, le due grandi democrazie possono trovare delle soluzioni assolutamente innovative e esportarle non solo in Asia ma appunto anche eh, sulla rotta dell'Indo Mediterraneo in Africa va bene, eh, mi scuserete se sono andato come sempre eh, sono andato eh, come sempre abbastanza velocemente ma eh, delle cose di cui abbiamo sentito parlare negli ultimi anni che hanno inondato eh, le nostre le televisioni i miti eh, a partire appunto dal mitico passaggio centrale eh, della BRI ai eh, problemi della grande sicurezza verso l'India Mediterraneo eh, al fatto se Suez sarà capace di reggere, regge benissimo eh, a Suez passano 12.000 navi, nel Bosforo ne passano 52.000 quindi siamo in grado di fare sicuramente delle grandi cose anche per, eh, per la sicurezza e per il passaggio a Suez e il collegamento importantissimo per l'Europa di una via marittima a sud che rappresenti però una libertà eh, di scambio eh, vera e un rispetto delle regole eh, internazionali quindi molte cose da sviluppare molte cose interessanti molte cose anche strategiche più di quello che non appaia addirittura nei verbali e nei riassunti che abbiamo fatto Oggi forse le potremmo ampliare ed analizzare, è il nostro compito, è il compito dell'associazione del dottor Sinoi, è il compito dell'associazione dell di competizione internazionale di Venezia e quindi ascolto volentieri tutti quelli che potranno essere i successivi importanti interventi, oltre a quello naturalmente della passatrice, eh, che ringrazio ancora e, mh, e sono qui pronto eventualmente, anche se c'è un po' di spazio, ma mi sembra che abbiamo dei tempi eh, abbastanza contenuti eh, e quindi eh, ora eh, mi metto ad ascoltare. Uh, grazie mille professore. Uh, I'll just provide a brief translation in English for all our Indian viewers. Uh... Ah, scusate, mi ho parlato in italiano, io in realtà pensavo che dopo arrivassero interventi in italiano. <ride> Va bene, dai. No, 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 prof, non ti preoccupare, e purtroppo non abbiamo potuto attivare la traduzione simultanea oggi anche. Unfortunately, ah. we weren't able to do simultaneous translation today, but uh, I have made some notes and if I miss a point or two, please forgive me. So, uh, apart from thanking uh, everybody and, of course, the organization he heads, um, that has co-organized this event. Uh, what Professor Panisha points out is that yesterday's meeting was most important because two great democracies, for the first, for the second time, the European Union and India met together and discussed themes which will probably set uh, the, the, the discussion for the next 10 years to come because uh, the first most important thing was the renewing of the negotiations of the free trade agreement which has stalled for several years while uh, for years europe has been very focused on the transatlantic alliance between two great democracies which is the usa and the eu uh, it is now specifically with the threats to the east and very diplomatically uh, the professor didn't name any countries but uh, uh, you know, we were talking about the elephant in the room. So given the threats to the East, the EU is now very sensitive and v for it, the partnership with India, which has basically been historically the fundamental relationship the EU has had to the East because of colonies, because of all of this. Uh, and very importantly, now this partnership brings with it not only uh, exchanges in technology and cooperation in technology, but also there is a lot of discussion on cooperation of infrastructure. There's also a big necessity for both sides to uh, figure out uh, youth employment because India is a young country and 
Europe has a huge problem with youth employment, and both sides have the capacity and the ability to come up with innovative solutions and not just come up with them, but export them to each other. So apart from infrastructure and youth employment, we also have a huge discussion on environment, which is you know, justly between both the, both, both the blocks because uh, both the blocks are great, great producers, great exporters, and this also brings in the global warming equation. This also brings in a, a common discussion on the use of plastics and the abolishing of the use of plastics. Uh, and also, finally, uh, you know, we, we live in very strange times. For the first time uh, in, in a very long time, there has been a questioning of whether Suez will, uh, you know, be able to handle uh, the trade between the two blocks uh, because of the Suez, the recent Suez crisis. Uh, there is a question of the security of the Indo-Pacific. There is a question, question of security in the Mediterranean, which has, uh, you know, which has been new with the whole uh, yeah. problem between Turkey and uh, the various EU members. Uh, now, for all of this, there are two very solid democracies that found each other again yesterday uh, to discuss and to deliberate and. Uh, as Macron said, you know, there's been a lot of people chastising the Indian government about its vaccine policy and uh, the French president was kind enough to say that India, when it could, has helped the world uh, vaccinate itself and suddenly it finds itself in trouble and uh, instead of pontification, it requires support. And uh, this is what friends do, they support each other when there is need. And uh, yesterday's summit was not just uh, all that the declarations were about, but it was a lot more that was not said in the declarations. And I think that's what we're here to analyze today and do a day after analysis, because yesterday was a historic moment that deserves to be thought about for a couple of days to come and analyzed really well, because this will set the tone for the future cooperation. So that was in brief, uh, Professor Vanisha's speech. Uh, di nuovo, Professore, perdonami se ho perso qualche punto. Pardon no, me. no, it's okay, Vas. I, uh, you, you get a new job, Vas, a translator. <laughs> thank you so much. It's so, very easy. <laughs> right, totally. so, okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I will invite our next guest, um, uh, Danilo Taino, a, a senior journalist uh, with Corriere della Sera, as well as uh, one of Italy's India experts, and uh, I might call a dear friend, uh, to say a few words. Thank you. Danilo, please. Thank you. Thank you, Vas. Uh, thank you to everybody for being here. Uh, I, I totally agree that uh, the yesterday's meeting su summit was, uh, was very important. I am not, I'm less surprised from the Indian approach than from the uh, European approach. I'm more, I am more surprised by the, the, the European Union approach because the European Union is not a geopolitical uh, entity. It's not been a geopolitical entity until now. And only now is starting to think in, in a geopolitical way. Not, this is not true for the whole of the continent. This is true for some countries more than others. Unfortunately, Britain, that has a geopolitical approach, is not, is not in the European Union anymore. But Britain is a friend of India, of course, and also, I hope, a friend of the European Union. So I, I, I suppose we can, we can join together in, 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 the, in the future. Uh, so I'm quite surprised that the European Union opened the window and also arms in some way to a, a, a new partnership, I hope it will be with, uh, with India. It is important for geopolitical reasons, first of all, uh, because uh, I think that now uh, the, the issue of Indo-Pacific that, that has been taken up by the European Union in the last few months is going to be one of the central issue of, uh, of the next, uh, of the next uh, years and probably decades. So I think that the relationship with India will be at the center of the interest, both for the European Union and for the United States as well. I think the, um, 
nobody spoke, if I understand correctly, yesterday about China, not openly, but I think that China is always there when we speak of the new relationships in the world. And uh, I think that we have to think very seriously and in a concrete way how to develop a partnership and a relationship between uh, Europe and, uh, and India. I think that connectivity, that is something different, I suppose, from the Belt and Road Initiative, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, more open, more based roads, I suppose, and more respectful of human rights and uh, civil rights as well, and more respectful of contracts probably as well, I think will be one of the major points of the, of the new relationship. Uh, we have to be realistic about the situation. There are a few countries in, uh, in Europe, important countries, that are not so enthusiastic about the, ge the geopolitical dimension of the European Union. They don't believe very much in that. And uh, I don't want to make any name, but I wanted to speak about Germany. In Germany, it's quite difficult to, uh, because of the history of the country, the recent history, the 20th century history of the country, I think that the population, the German population and the German establishment are not, are fearful of a geopolitical, uh, geopolitical discourse, of geopolitical conversation because they think they prefer to the commercial side of the issues because the strength of the, of the country, the strength of Germany, that is the key player in Europe, uh, is uh, the choice has been made. The, the, the strength of the country will be in, has been in the past, in the, in the last decades, and will be in the future uh, about the economy not about a, a geopolitical strength because of the history, of course. And uh, this is a problem, I think. If you speak, if, if you look at the opinion polls in Germany, but this is quite true also in other countries in Europe, but if you look at that in Germany, it will be very difficult to convince the majority of the people that you need to be strong in this new situation, because the new situation is the conflict, the confrontation between great powers. And in this confrontation, Europe is still still quite, uh, quite late, is arriving quite late in this situation. So I think that the relationship between Europe and India will be the test, not in general, but also for the European Union, if European Union wants to have a, job, a true geopolitical dimension, I think that India will be the key partner for demonstrating that it is possible. Uh, I'm not sure it will be, because uh, I think that will be, it will not be easy, but I think, I hope that it will be, it will be done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danilo. Uh, I think it was very interesting when you said that um, that that Europe does not have is not a geopolitical entity, and it just brings me back to uh, six seven hundred years ago when European powers were actually fighting over India uh, with each other, and, and the Brit and, and the British, as usual, went all by themselves and took the biggest chunk, and um, uh, just brings me back to Prime Minister Johnson's bilateral summit with Narendra Modi last week. Uh, which was kind of, you know, in a way to upstage the European. So I think the competition's back again for supremacy in India, but let's hope not. Let's hope you all play nice this time. Um, I would, uh, we, we, we now have a young voice from India, um, Ame Prabhu, who is a young entrepreneur as well as an author. Uh, he's also very active socially and politically in India. Uh, Ame, we'd definitely like to have a few words from you if it's if if you're there yeah hi thank you Vas, and uh Gracie, as i should say to you and firstly uh, thank you everyone for having me on this platform and i certainly agree with uh, professor panik here that uh, vas in a way stands for value added service because you're also helping us not just with translation but putting everything together and 
that you are a phenomenal ambassador for India in the EU and in Italy. So I think uh, I, I really laud your efforts at bringing us two great democracies together on the people-to-people -people level. But uh, firstly, of course, everybody spoke about the importance of yesterday's summit. But I believe that I cannot emphasize enough how you know important it is that all uh, the you know all, for example, both Charles Michel, Ursula von der Leyen, as well as President Macron, spoke so positively about the India relationship. So you know, and uh, even the Belgian Prime Minister actually spoke to our Prime Minister in his native Gujarati when he uh, initially spoke because there is a large population of. Uh, uh, Gujaratis in Belgium in the diamond trade. So I think, you know, I think the India-EU relationship and as you know, uh, it's, it's a relationship between two great democrat democracies. Uh, it's a relationship that is very ancient. I mean, in terms of trade, India has traded with the Roman Empire since uh, for thousands of years. And I mean, Indian coins have been found in Rome and similarly Roman coins were found in, in, in across the India, uh, Indian subcontinent. So We've had a really relationship, a commercial relationship, a political relationship, which has transcended thousands of years. And I think it is extremely important that as we move forward in this ever-changing global dynamic, that we focus on building ever closer ties. And these ties should be level. Uh, of course, our governments, both the EU as well as the respective uh, nation states of the EU, are building closer relationship at a government level. I think we need, we, we have, while we have close relationships at a business level, I think we need to expand that. And I think we could even expand that beyond the traditional uh, uh, EU countries, which are closer to India, such as a France. We have a very close defense partnership with France. We have a very close partnership with Germany on the, uh, uh, you know, on, on the industrial side. Uh, similarly, we have, a, we work closely with Belgium. But I think even some of the uh, other countries, uh, of course, we have a we work also closely with Italy. But some of the other countries where I would say India is not as uh, you know would still be a bit lightweight on would be say Spain or would be say even uh, even Poland or some of the newer countries that have joined the bloc in the East. I think that uh, using the EU as a platform it will be important for India or uh, to work across the spectrum with all the EU countries. So, so I think we need to close the relationship on the business side. But I think this transcends beyond that. We need to also work closer culturally. I mean, I was watching a movie yesterday in my native language, which is Marathi, on Netflix called The Disciple, which won an award at the Venice Film Festival. But I think on the cultural side, be it cinema, be it people-to-people -people contact in terms of culture, again, uh, we share, as I said, we are both very ancient countries. You know, unlike the United States, India and EU, or all, all the EU uh, countries, we are very ancient countries with a long history of culture. So I think cultural contact, but also academic contact between our institutions. So I think what is important is that we shouldn't confine this relationship only to a political or a commercial relationship, but it should, as I say, it should really be a heart, mind, body, and soul relationship, not just at one level. So I think it is an important uh, I would say probably India's most important relationship in the world today. I would I personally place it above our relationship with the US. And that's because uh, I do believe, I mean, of course, I, I would say I'm slightly biased because I did live in Europe for uh, a decent amount of time. But also, I think, I, I think that the relationship with uh, the, the EU also tends to be emotional. You know, it just, it's, it's just not about real politic or it's just not about... Uh, you know, a mutual self-interest. It also tends to be emotional because Europeans, like Indians, are emotional people, and it is it is something which uh, is uh, which is something which is very fundamental to how we Indians are. So, so you know, so I think it, it it's a relationship which I think uh, will become stronger over time. It will it will become a relationship that is uh, going, as I said, going to transcend various levels of association. And I think I would like to thank President Macron for what he said is that the world does not need to lecture India today in terms of uh, vaccine diplomacy. I mean, and the fact that, you know, in terms of the number of doses we have already given, almost 170 million doses that we have given, and even at the rate, I mean, I was talking to one of the, one of my friends in the Middle Eastern countries who have probably vaccinated about 30, 40% of the country. 
and I was like, you know, we would be able to vaccinate your entire country in four days. But despite the, and I think that's a part of Indian culture that despite the fact, you know, I remember when I was in school in UWC, the same chain of schools that Vas went to, and uh, I was in the rural area of India, and I remember one of the housekeepers, the janitors who lived in the village close to my boarding school, invited me home. And you know, when he invited me home, he cooked us a nice chicken meal, and he told me he had just mentioned in passing that he had seven chickens, but he cooked two of them for me. And incidentally, I actually went with my Italian roommate. I took him with me that day, uh, Gianluca. Both of us went. But the reason I mentioned that is in our culture. We share even when we don't have enough. A lot of cultures actually share only when their stomach is full. In India, we share even when our stomach is not full because we want others to also partake in what we have. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, our government, as well as our people, decided to you know partake in vaccine diplomacy. And and this was not just given to Maldives or Seychelles or Zimbabwe or Brazil, but also Canada and several other countries are recipients of the uh, Indian vaccine export. And of course, COVID is a big challenge. It's an immediate challenge, and as we all know, the past few weeks have been very difficult. And you know, while we uh, were standing in in uh, complete solidarity with our Italian brothers and sisters in Italy and Lombardy, especially, was going through the same scenario. I'm very happy that the EU, as well as most of the world, has also stood by us in this difficult time. And while I, I personally believe that. We might be reaching the peak pretty soon, and as you know, India is a federal country, so different states will keep reaching different uh, peaks at different points in time. But I do think that in the post-COVID world, where healthcare will be a very important element, I do think that uh, we can hope and pray that we can work together as a globe to prevent such future pandemics, and also realize that the other global issues such as the environment, such as you know. Uh, racism, or such as post, uh, or such as issues pertaining to disarmament. So I think we can take very important lessons from COVID that we all have one planet, we all have to work together. Something that happens in China does affect the rest of the world. Something that happens in another part of the world does affect, you know, China or in India. So we need to work together, and let us hope that EU, India, and uh, of course our ambassador spoke about how India is doing on climate. But I think we all need to work together because, you know, uh, moving forward. And I think that that could be a very important element of cooperation. Finally, uh, before I conclude, I would like to say that uh, uh, I'm very happy to be involved from the Indian side in terms of furthering dialogue with uh, uh, the EU at various levels. Furthermore, I'm, I mean, I'm also an author. So in my last book, uh, which which was published by Amazon, there are quite a few of the stories actually based in Europe. And all across, so it's something very close to my heart. And uh, I do hope that this is actually the longest I've been away from Europe for many years. You know, probably in the last 25 years, uh, I've not come to Europe since actually September of 2019. So I do, do hope that I can return to European shows soon and uh, work towards uh, furthering our people-to-people -people partnership. Thank you, Namaste, and Arividachi. Thanks so much, Ame, and um, I, I sincerely echo your sentiment that. The next time we do this discussion, it's in person and not, it's over a glass of wine and not over a, a web platform. So I think all of us are quite happy with that. Uh, uh, I'll turn this over briefly to Matteo Carnialetto, who is the editor of Il Giornale.it and the head of Inside Over, uh, one of the major uh, news platforms in Italy and upcoming uh, blogging platforms in Italy, Matteo. Relations between India and uh, the European Union are pivotal in the framework of the international scenarios of a globalized world. India and uh, European countries are pursuing a connection between the old continent and the subcontinent, which has seen many precedents in the long history of these two worlds interconnected for so long. Two systems evoking different civilizations and stories, which now find themselves dealing with a global scenario to which they must make a contribution dictated by common values. Security and the affirmation of the rule of law, multi multilateralism as a means towards resolving disputes, the promotion of the, the values of freedom of trade, 
the assurance of the proper conduct of maritime traffic, the prospective establishment of common standards for the ethical and democratic use of the new technologies. The last frontier in a far reaching and a fruitful relation on the commercial front. In 2019, before the pandemic, bilateral trade between India and the European Union had exceeded $100 billion, testifying to the fact that on the economic front too, common interests are expansive and diverse. Yet simple figures and the economy are not enough to com convoy the extent of the, important, the importance of ties between the European Union and India. India is uh, one of the natural partners on which Europe can and must rely on for the promotion of its values and of its strategic ob objectives in various fields, from diplomacy to the realm of technology. Their partnership is based on the shared values of democracy, pluralism, lawfulness, and respect for human rights. India was one of the first developing nations to offer diplomatic recognition to the Six Nation European Economic Community, the precursor of today's union founded with the 1992 Maastricht Treaty. With the new millennium and the gradual rise of New Delhi as an important player in the economic and geopolitical fields, and with the advance of global, globalization, India and the European, the European Union felt the need to strengthen their cooperation. The Lisbon summit in 2000 was the first India-European Union bilateral meeting. The then Union President, Portuguese Prime Minister and current UN Secretary um, Antonio Guterres and the India Prime Minister Atal Behari Bajpayee signed a cooperation agreement recognizing each other as an important partner in the multi multipolar world. At the same time, the plan stressed to the need to work to promote social and economic development and prosperity, as well as peace, stability, and security at uh, an international level, and to promote peace, um, stability, and security in and beyond their respective geographical areas through bilateral dialogue and trust building measures between the countries concerned. There was the awareness of important challenges and mutual problems. Think of terrorism or the climate emergency, which require constant dialogue between the planet's major players. Today, in this day, when a new summit was to be held in Portugal, in Oporto, in the presence of India and the European authorities, we recognize as fundamental the matrix of this shared commitment for which both Brussels and New Delhi have every interest in engaging. It is also essential to think of relations between India and the European Union in a multi-dimensional form, summing to the direct relations, relations between Brussels and New Delhi, those that unite India with the member country of the community of 27 and the enhancement of the role that Indians in the old continent have uh, in forging greater mutual understanding. Indian communities in countries such as Italy are a clear example of successful integration and the possibility for representative for representatives of a people who find themselves linked outside their national border to combine their contribution through their work and their intellect to the progress of their host country with the possibility of maintaining a fruitful and dynamic bond with the, their homeland. Relations between countries and communities are primarily relations, relationships between human beings. Enhancing the Euro-Indian partnership in the name of common progress will mean enhancing relations and institutional, economic, social, and collective level. Each of these dimensions takes on a fundamental value in plotting the trajectory of an increasingly solid alliance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matteo, and thank you so much for making that speech in English, because uh, I know for a fact that you'd have said a lot more had it been in Italian, but uh, thank you for making that effort for us. Uh, yes, so uh, I have our uh, star speaker, uh, Manish Chand, uh, very experienced Indian journalist, as well as political analyst with us, and I will ask him something before he starts speaking and say, Manish, connectivity. Connectivity comes 5G to me, 
connectivity infrastructure, connectivity, as President von der Leyen said yesterday, the only time that the EU has done anything on connectivity as almost as much as what they're trying to do with India is with Japan and security. I mean, we, we're again, you know, China has taken our lives over and we've let it. Um, you know, they make our chips, they make our electronics, and we're in a world where we're really dependent on China. So could you please, um, you know, focus on connectivity and security and Indo-Pacific and Indo-Mediterranean, because I think these, these, are, these, these are themes that really need some focus today. Sorry. Yeah, now it's okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Vas, for inviting me for this uh, very important discussion. I really appreciate your taking uh, this initiative to bring, uh, you know, scholars, experts, especially from India and Italy together for this much needed conversation. Now, uh, you know, the speakers before me have already spoken about important facets of the India EU summit. I think this summit, particularly the May 8th summit, was a uh, was a landmark summit, was a transformational summit in many ways. It has really pitchforked uh, India-EU partnership onto a higher trajectory. And it's not just talk, you know, I mean, there was a sense the perception gaining ground in, in India in among strategic circles, among people, uh, that India, EU, whenever they get together, it's just a lot of talk. So this summit proves those skeptics wrong. Uh, because of the substantive outcomes, which are not really talk. So I think we are moving from the declaratory rhetorical phase to the action-oriented phase. Finally, we're walking the talk. And uh, two clear examples of that is, uh, number one, of course, the resumption of trade negotiations. After a thousand visits and revisions, as T.S. Eliot, the poet, would say, uh, finally, we are launching, we're resuming those uh, negotiations. And of course, the number two, a very big ticket outcome uh, of this summit uh, was the connectivity partnership. Now, connectivity partnership is transformational in many ways. First of all, connectivity by its nature is something very tangible. It's no longer, it's not really about talk. You have to walk the talk. Connect, it is about connecting. And uh, the document that has emerged out of that, there's a standalone document, standalone joint statement on EU-India Connectivity Partnership, which is very uh, comprehensive, which is very ambitious. And the scope of this partnership encompasses key facets, you know. Uh, so it's, it's about digital connectivity. It is, you know, the three domains or four domains are listed, digital, energy, transport, people to people. Uh, so this is uh, quite exhilarating uh, to, to see this kind of effort. In its, uh, let me highlight a few uh, points about this connectivity partnership. Uh, so, you know, the now point number one is this, that the connectivity uh, partnership uh, sends a powerful message across that the two sides are finally moving beyond simply talk to build tangible, physical uh, connectivity and infrastructure partnerships uh, in not only each other's uh, uh, region, but also in third country. Now, you know, if you translate it into physicality, of course, there is some distance to cover. What you have is India-EU joint projects in important regions. You have Asia, you have uh, Africa, Central Asia, Africa, Indo-Pacific. Now, once this is executed, of course, you know, the document talks about and the effort going ahead would be about uh, exploring those pilot projects. Given the very nature of infrastructure projects, they, you know, not just finance, uh, but long gestation projects, it's going to take quite a bit of time. But once you get going, there are no stopping it because there is a huge hunger for high quality infrastructure across the world. Uh, also, when these projects finally come up, they will be visible emblems of India-EU partnership. So, you know, it provides that, you know, more visibility, more heft to the India-EU economic partnership. This is very important because this was really the impression uh, that was going on. You know, for example, it has taken eight years for us to just start talking, relaunch trade negotiations, and it's going to take some time to get there. Uh, 
The second point is that, yes, uh, the connectivity partnership has been conceptualized and designed as an alternative to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Now, which is seen as a, as a symbol of predatory capitalism, uh, which is accused of imposing onerous debt burdens on beneficiary countries or plunging these countries into very crippling uh, uh, debt traps. Uh, so, you know, let me talk about this part att attracts a lot of attention, you know, anything that provides counter. China is anyway, whenever you bring this into a geopolitical discourse, it spices the oh, China threat, China rivalry and all that. So it's always good to sex up a discourse, uh, so to say, with this China factor. Uh, but I think what one sees here is a great deal of realism and pragmatism. So, of course, we are talking about in this, the way it has been articulated uh, and presented this uh, connectivity package, that it will be rules based. It will be transparent. It will be based on principles of, you know, fiscal sustainability as well as environmental sustainability. What it all adds up to is that the infrastructure projects by their nature should benefit people for whom this infrastructure is built. But I think in, in, in uh, you know, conceptualizing, in doing, you know, thinking really big, like for example, Chinese have done these huge projects and all that, some or other people are no longer at the center of these projects. And I think mean, this is the, the big uh, gap which this partnership addresses. It, positions people at the center of it by extension, you know, because when you're talking about uh, uh, environmental sustainability, of course, you're making these projects healthier, more, uh, you know, uh, palatable for the common man. You know. When you are talking about uh, fiscal uh, sustainability, not imposing debt obligation, you are talking about liberating. Infrastructure should liberate the nation's potential for whom it is meant, as well as people's potential. I think these are the fundamental animating principle. And I'm glad to see that these principles are being enunciated upfront in this document. And hopefully they will guide these projects. And that's where their attraction will lie. So I think this is a, a very significant uh, part facet of this partnership. Now, if one uh, goes and uh, scans this document carefully, uh, it's around a little over 2,400 words, some, somewhere around that. So it also talks about sustainable uh, projects, sustainable digital transport and energy networks. The word sustainable is significant because uh, by comparison, uh, you know, uh, many of these uh, so-called BRI projects have been abandoned midway. So only do those things which are sustainable. Because when you leave things midway, it really leads to a lot of, uh, you know, waste and heartburn in the process. Okay. So that's also uh, very important. Another important part of this private uh, partnership connectivity is that unlike the state uh, driven model, the public sector driven model, this envisages PPP model, that is public private partnership. And it envisages a bigger role for the private sector. So, uh, so you know, in this, uh, this is very important because private sector will put Money where money needs to be put, you know. They're not going to do in philanthropy, doing this talk. So they, they, it, they will strive to make it viable. There's nothing dirty about profit. So getting private sector means more accountability. Getting private sector also by extension would mean that one can expect these projects uh, to be delivered on time. Because if you delay, it will add cost. So... So the, the, the big pivotal role of the private sector is most welcome. Uh, also, I see, and there are, some, there are quite a few things which uh, uh, really needs to be worked out. Because really, I mean, this is a very impressive document that has emerged out of it, but a lot of it is the proof of the pudding lies in the eating of it, how they plan, how they conceptualize those first pilot projects, how soon they can get it off the ground. This is what... Uh, people will be watching. So uh, uh, one can go on and on, but let me uh, tell you that uh, as far as uh, the success of these projects lies, 
there got to be a mantra of three S mantra, which uh, Prime Minister Modi often talks about is skill, scale, and speed. So, you know, uh, we have the skill and we probably, and we are aiming at scale. What is important is the speed. Speed is, you've got to really pick up the speed as you translate this into reality. Why this is important? Because, uh, you know, many of the projects here which have uh, been undertaken by India uh, uh, in, in a spirit of critique, one would say, uh, have uh, sometimes languished uh, due to, you know, lack of tempo, you know, lack of sufficient uh, pace, uh, speed in implementation. Then what happens that uh, brilliant projects, you know, projects which are potentially transformative, they start suffering from credibility gap. You promise the moon and you don't deliver. So I think we should not promise too much India, EU, because this is important part of this connectivity partnership is projects in third country. So this is very important to retain our credibility that we should not over promise and then under deliver. So we should only do what is practical, possible within time frame. These things are very important because this is really a document uh, which could uh, create an alternative paradigm of connectivity and strengthen the way, web of prosperity, uh, 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 shared web of prosperity around the world. One last point I want to basically highlight is, as I was telling, that it talks about people-to-people -people connectivity. It talks about, and I was talking earlier about uh, positioning people at the heart of uh, this partnership. Because at the end of the day, infrastructure, all these projects are actually taken in the name of people. So let not people themselves be pushed aside. And other considerations take center stage. Let's resolutely uh, put people at the center stage. And then one uh, important point connected with this is that hard infrastructure is very well. You know, dams, bridges, roads, and all that. Uh, physical infrastructure. I'm talking about the India-EU relationship. It needs to be uh, complemented with a cultural soft infrastructure. By that, I mean cultural connectivity, people-to-people -people connectivity has to increase because, you know, uh, it's good that we are having this conversation. But to be very honest, uh, for people in India, Europe means only a few countries. Uh, those beautiful countries, they like to, uh, you know, dream of having glamorous holidays. So it is France, it is Italy, it is Florence and the weddings and all that. Spain, uh, we uh, do not have a concrete idea of Europeans as a people. I mean, this is just a reflection. The same goes for, I think, Europeans. I don't know how many uh, Europeans have a concrete idea of contemporary Indian or contemporary India. And a lot of it is reflected in this very biased and prejudiced commentary, a very arrogant commentary, a hubristic commentary that is flowing from the international news and uh, edit pages, uh, which are, you know, portraying India as a kind of, you know, collapsing and were indulging in pandemic, as they say, you know, scavenging, you know. You are talking about people, uh, funeral pyres being burned. It is obscene. It is tasteless. It reflects uh, a lack of understanding of the other's culture. We, when India, when Europe was going through uh, hell, literally, you know, and it went through a very difficult phase, uh, you know, we uh, rallied immediately. One should not exult in other people's misfortune. Of course, a lot of things could have been done better. But at the end of the day, it is a disease. So I think this uh, point, when we are talking about connectivity, but linked up with this is the idea of uh, people to people and cultural connectivity and investing more time and effort in promoting mutual uh, cultural understanding. Understanding the other uh, should be also central because you can build these roads and all, but at the end of the day, uh, people are going to be walking over it. And then those people who will walk over it, Indians and Europeans uh, and other from other regions, they should greet each other. They, they, they should not have mutual suspicion. So I end with uh, only one thing, which is, uh, you know, that only connect and connect genuinely and India and Europe, uh, European Union are finally moving in the right direction with a skill, scale and speed, hopefully. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Manish. Um, I will open to questions from uh, our floor. 
but I have a question of my own to Danilo, who um, has been uh, the correspondent of Corriere della Sera, if I'm not mistaken, in Berlin for a very long time. So, like, <coughs> German specific. Uh, I happened to see the uh, press conference of President von der Leyen, and her line, she genuinely seemed very enthusiastic about the conclusions of the summit and seemed to be 100% committed to this troika of Antonio Costa, John Michael and herself, uh, pushing this India-Italy deal ahead. But her mentor, uh, who is now fading out of the picture, uh, the German Chancellor Merkel, seems to be far more pro-China and her stand seems to be a little uh, away from the rest. How would you see this translating with the next government in Berlin? Uh, would it be pro von der Leyen? Would it be uh, pro Merkel? Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, Lars, it's really difficult to say because uh, we don't know which government will uh, win the elections next uh, 26th of September. So uh, it's, it's really not easy. But there is something that we can say right now that uh, Germany needs absolutely to change. In the last few decades, I think that the, the economic model and political model, because economy and policy is very, very interlinked in Germany, even more than in other countries, I think. Uh, I think that this model has been the model, uh, the success of this model has been the success of the globalization. I think that the two big winners of the globalization in the last few decades has been China and Germany, the, the biggest exporters in the world. Uh, I think they, they have to change that because uh, the situation now is different. I am not saying that uh, globalization is going to end to, to finish, but I think that the situation is uh, different now. And now, I, I, like I said before, uh, I think that the geopolitical dimension is much more important than in the past. I think in this situation, the uh, economic model of Germany will have to change. It will not be easy. It will not be easy. And also the political situation will change. It will not be easy because uh, think, uh, for example, to the um, automotive industry that is really big in Germany, very important. And the China is very important for uh, and Merkel is a big defender of the automotive industry in Germany. In Germany. So she is very much a commercial uh, leader in, in that sense. She has been also very much political in, a, in other situations, of course, but uh, she understands better the, the, the situation of the last few decades than the new situation. She, she doesn't like, she, even, she, she doesn't even like uh, Biden. Just to be clear, not speaking about Trump, obviously. So I think that we're, uh, it depends. If now the Greens are going to win the elections or enter the government, I think that there will they will be probably more uh, open to 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 be clear about China. Let's say in in this way. But uh, I think that China and also Russia. Will, will be very important for Germany also in the next few years. I think that the new government will not be an easy government for Germany and for Europe, for Europe because Germany is the core of Europe. Thank you so much, Danilo. Um, it wasn't an easy question, so forgive me, but uh, uh, von der Leyen's uh, very, very genuine enthusiasm at the end of the summit uh, just made me wish that she had succeeded Merkel <laughs> for at least the India deal because, you know, uh, Merkel pushed ahead the comprehensive investment agreement with China the last few days of the German presidency for obviously the car lobbies. And um, I, I, I have another question which I will put to all the speakers, but let's start with Manish. Uh, Manish, the Anglo-Saxon Indian alliance, uh, which has obviously tried now uh, in the past couple of weeks to upstage the India-EU summit. Uh, you have one end, Biden, who announced uh, a big announcement on vaccines just days before the EU-India summit. 
you have uh, the British Prime Minister who went right ahead with the UK India summit announcing four four billion dollars of sterling of bilateral investment and a part of it from India to the UK. So you have uh, Poonawala and Serum Institute set up a manufacturing plant in the UK, etc. Now, uh, to me, this whole Anglo-Saxon lobby, uh, you know, uh, trying to upstage the EU continental lobby just sounds like the old story from 400 years ago, nothing's changed. Uh, what are your thoughts? Who's going to win this time? You're mute, Manish. Uh, what I'm saying is that, Vas, you put this question in a very intriguing way about you know this game uh, competition, one-upmanship and all that. Uh, but my sense is that if you look at it uh, from India's point of view, it is uh, good to have many sweeters. It's good to be coated, uh, you know, despite, uh, you know, gloom and doom uh, narratives peddled about India. I mean, I've written about it. The very fact that 27 leaders of 27 nations got together for the first ever 27 plus one summit. Uh, with India is a big word of confidence in the India growth story. And in terms of symbolism, in terms of optics, that outstrips, you know, in a sense, uh, we haven't had uh, Modi and Joe Biden haven't had a summit as such so far. Uh, with Boris Johnson, we had the summit and digital summit. The timing was such that, you know, with both parts of the former EU, uh, we have managed to reinvent, uh, provide, that, you know, I mean, for example, we are talking about transformational diplomacy and the term transformational was used uh, many times in the conversations relating to uh, India-UK summit, for example. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and of course, I think this is very genuinely transformational, a very pivotal moment in India. So, you know, there, there are, if there is one winner in this, uh, potentially, and uh, once we get this, uh, this monster COVID under control, it is going to be probably... Uh, India, it's good to see so much uh, global interest from our strategic partners of bringing that extra energy and enthusiasm and not giving up. So that in that context, I think, again, you know, the what uh, French President uh, Macron said that, you know, India doesn't need lectures. I think that is a big put down to all those guys, you know, who have been, you know, going ballistic about things not being done and all. Uh, that's a separate story. But I think that again shows a vote of confidence. The fact that the Portuguese prime minister would, uh, the Belgian, was it, who spoke to Modi in, uh, you know, Gujarat, you know, uh, that extra touch. So I think the, regardless of the narrative being peddled around, uh, India, like a phoenix, will rise again uh, and all that. And I think the world is betting on that. And this EU summit was a classic example of that vote of confidence in India. Uh, thank you so much, Manish. Uh, that reminds me of a very nice article Danilo had written recently on Indian diaspora and its lobbying power. So whether it was Antonio Costa or, uh, you know, we hope soon uh, one day we'll see a British Indian prime minister at the helm, uh, whether it's Rishi Sunak or somebody else. I do believe that the diaspora has a lot of goodwill to contribute to um, all these efforts that are um, happening. Uh, that said, uh, from here onwards, this is the first time Danilo said this, and I bring this up again, that the EU has started acting like a geopolitical power. It's taken a position. Uh, Danilo, would you see this as contrast to the NATO uh, treaty, or do you see the EU and the United States eventually sharing power vis-a-vis Indo-Pacific, Indo-Mediterranean trade? Because there was also a mention of ASEAN-10, uh, so this connectivity was not just limited to Africa, but it was also extended to ASEAN 10 in direct opposition to uh, the Chinese treaty that was signed in November of last year, the RETC. Uh, also, the TR, the, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, that was that disappeared somewhere from Obama land to Bidenville uh, in the journey. Do you see America and Europe sharing uh, responsibilities, or do you see Quad and EU India developing onto parallel tracks. 
I think that the, the international situation is very confused, still very confused. I think that uh, the, the disorder in the world is, is great, so you can't be sure of what's going to happen. But I think that for Europe, it will be suicidal to uh, broken up with, uh, with NATO and with the Atlantic Alliance. I think that both both uh, United States and Europe are now speaking about the Indo-Pacific and there is an Indo-Pacific strategy open seas uh, to secure the freedom of navigation in the two oceans. So I think that both Europe and America are understanding that the center of the world is going to be in the next, right now, but in the next uh, decades, even more the center of, uh, of the game, I think. So I suppose, I suppose that a way of, I'm not sure it will be a, a formal alliance, but probably the end game will be the same for both uh, blocks, America I mean, and uh, the European Union, uh, also Britain. I would say, because also Britain is sending vessels in the in the Indian Ocean waters, also France. Uh, uh, Germany said so, but they're not so sure. Uh, but <laughs> I think I, I think that we will have a little test of this possibility in the next G7 in June in in Britain, where also India, Japan, and Australia will be uh, will be uh, with Boris, John Boris Johnson and uh, the other six uh, democracies. Uh, it, it, it is difficult to build a front uh, a front of democracies. In, in in it's not easy, but this is one of the ideas that Joe Biden spoke about uh, during the ele electoral campaign. So uh, I think that the issue of uh, democracy, of uh, uh, rule of law, and the international order uh, will be something that brings together Europe and the Anglo-Saxon sphere. Uh, professor, uh, I, I put this to you. Um, do you think our Atlantic friends and NATO will eventually reconcile with Quad? And would it, would it be a joint US-EU-India partnership for the Indo-Pacific? Or do you think on you know, per conto su? No, no, a joint, joint partnership in the Indo-Pacific. I, I guess will be a, a NATO and India partnership in the security of the Pacific. So, no, ognuno per i fatti suoi, <laughs> but all together <laughs> with democracy against autocracy. This is, will be the end of the game, I guess. Uh, Manish, what would you, uh, your two bits on this particular issue? A new G10, a new quad NATO coming together, because I mean, the countries are right, basically the same, uh, or are we talking about? Uh, you know, individual. So, yeah. Uh, so I think what uh, Professor was saying right now about the two models, the democracy model and the Beijing consensus, uh, you know, so to speak, yeah. I think that is going to be the larger contest. And within that, there'll be permutations and combinations. So we already have a quad. There is this idea that quad should have, because quad will cannot have more members by its very definition. Otherwise, it won't be quad. So they can only be observers unless they call it something else. Uh, so there is quad, there is a D10, which uh, Boris Johnson has spoken about, Democracy 10. And before that, Donald Trump uh, was talking about G10 and J11, but he did not, uh, you know, uh, survive to take that forward. But now Joe Biden is talking about uh, uh, Club of Democracy. Yeah. So I think what is happening is the larger contest of the two opposing value systems and alliances. Uh, I mean, India is not comfortable with the word alliance, but quasi alliances will be struck because the scale of the problem is such, you know, I mean, you look at whether it's freedom of navigation, uh, whether it's uh, core human rights, you know, the liberal values. 
uh, where uh, which bring Europe and India together. You know, normative. We are both normative powers. So I think that is going to be the trend of the. Uh, and one will surely see some of these combinations. You're saying that uh, India versus. So there is that China versus the rest. It looks like to me right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we, 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 we're, we're running short of time, but I think there's one thing that in the next couple of weeks we, we're going to have to face, and that is 5G, which is you know on the top of the Chinese strategy structure for the, tw for the 2050, because you know Chinese strategy is based on layers as usual. It's synchronous. So you had the BRI, then you have uh, make in, Made in China, then you have China 2030, and then you have Beyond, which 5G formed a very important part of. And India has been um, uh, applauded for standing up to the Chinese 5G. We do expect that Indian companies now will be uh, sued by Chinese suppliers for upgrades wherever possible. Harris, China will not go down quietly. Uh, do you think, just briefly, all three of you, do you think that the opposition to 5G will be united now, or do you think eventually China will manage to break through? Start with Danilo. Uh, I, I think that uh, strictly about uh, uh, 5G, I think that China is not to have a breakthrough in the, in the medium term. More in general, in the challenge of technology, I think that also uh, the, the next Nobel laureates will come from America, will come from India, more probably, but less from China. It is true that they have the biggest market for the self-driving uh, cars, but they don't have Tesla, they don't have Elon Musk. Professor? I agree completely. Yeah, I agree completely with uh, Danilo Mavish. They say very interesting, very, very interesting strategic <laughs> issues. Okay, is I guess the same. Um, next time uh, we will have a, 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 a US, uh, US strategy that will not, they cannot pass through, uh, the Chinese will not pass through, I guess. Maybe uh, maybe tomorrow it will change, but now I guess that uh, they are they are right, Danilo and and, and Manish, completely. Many Manish, any closing? Um, oh, basically, I mean, right. I mean, uh, they're both right. I mean, the point is that Indian government is already barred, uh, you know, Chinese companies from five G trial, and this whole five G business is uh, uh, about the larger. A race for uh, technological supremacy, uh, techno techno nationalism, which is shaping up and all. And again, out there, I think the two parties, uh, the two contrary factions, are aligned. You know, you have uh, liberal democracies, and you have, as uh, as Panini said, uh, authoritarian model of sorts. So I don't think there is really any meeting point. But at the same time, there is a practical part that uh, networks for all our talk. Now, China has a certain edge in that area, you know, telecom, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, telecom equipment and all that. A lot of R, for example, are still dependent. So one got to sort out, you know, these are practical things that as you decouple, so to speak, or not letting them in, how are you going to sort that out? Uh, but, you know, one, one final thought, uh, I want to say that, you know, of course, uh, the West is framing this. This is a new kind of ideological contest that is shaping up. Uh, of sorts, you know? uh, but you know, uh, as far as the India and the EU concerned, the agenda is so uh, transformative and it could potentially be uh, people oriented that I would say that yes, Indo-Pacific is fine. We must tighten our connect there because again, to defend those principles, but we should be uh, wary of, you know, just the geopolitical uh, rivalries hijacking the agenda. It should be people centric agenda, which will carry greater credibility. Because I see this is a tendency that we always get bogged down in the China, China, China containment. And the fact is that China is the largest trading partners continues to be of uh, 128 countries, including most of European, many European countries. So yes, the, the China is going to be a question. 
uh, but looking ahead, I think India and you should stick to uh, people focused agenda, which which makes uh, our people's lives better, you know, so to speak. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for making time again on Sunday. Uh, it's a pleasure to pleasure. Um, you know participate today, um, and I hope uh, we do. We are able to translate this whole. Uh, EU India summit into something much more concrete because in December already of last year relations between EU and India were looking quite bleak and suddenly there has been in the Portuguese presidency an immense change in new sunrise. So uh, here's to a longer relationship. I do hope that the next time we are able to do this is uh, across the table and not across computer screens and uh, thank you again and um, have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks. I really Thank enjoyed you. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. So we're going to be doing one uh, on India EU again uh, on maybe uh, around May 18th or so. So we'd be happy to have uh, our uh, friends from Italy today. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. With us, I'll, I'll make a common <laughs> mailing list. With yeah, yeah, I will pass it on to us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay.